Salvaging a failing truce, the US and Russia say they agree on potential military and intelligence cooperation in Syria. But the two countries have been supporting opposite sides in the conflict. So what will this mean for any possible political settlement in Syria? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. For some time now, the United States and Russia have been trying to work together to help end the impasse in Syria. And we know they have had limited, if any, success so far. But after meeting for the second time this month, the US Secretary of State John Kerry and his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov say they're close to doing some kind of deal. What's unfortunately not clear at this stage is if it will actually benefit the Syrian people. Here's what they've been saying, though. Russia and the United States want to establish better intelligence sharing, particularly to coordinate strikes against armed groups, including on Nusra Front, and potentially to stop the Syrian Air Force from targeting the so-called moderate rebel groups. There's also been another push for a ceasefire and political talks. That's the UN Special Envoy for Syria, who's holding closed-door meetings with US and Russian delegates in Geneva. But not everyone's happy about the US and Russia working closely together. American military and intelligence officials have been open about their skepticism, saying talks with Russia are not based on trust, just mutual interest. So US Secretary of State John Kerry concedes progress is difficult, but says he's hopeful a breakthrough can be made maybe in the next month. In simple terms, what everybody knows we're trying to do is strengthen the cessation of hostilities, provide a framework which allows us to actually get to the table and have a real negotiation and try to move forward here. And uh, we had a good meeting today, but we have more homework coming out of today's meeting. And, and we're going to do it and do it quietly with the same spirit that we've made the progress of the last uh, week or so in. So let's introduce you to the panel for today. First of all, in Riyadh, we have Ube Shabandar, who is the managing director of Orient Media, that is a Syrian opposition media group. In London is Fawaz Jerjes, chair of contemporary Middle East studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And rounding out the panel in Beirut, Thanasi Kombani, who is a fellow at the think tank Century Foundation. Gentlemen, lovely to have you with us. Thank you for your time. I think the first and most important point we have to get to is that what we are seeing from John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov is a shared military strategy. Is it therefore an admission, and maybe I'll start with you, Fawaz, is this an admission from the US and Russia that the whole Geneva diplomatic process is, well, if not a waste of time, then not really worth it at the moment? Well, I think it's an acknowledgement that the priority is for fighting terrorism, uh, the priority is for Russian-American uh, strategic uh, coordination. Uh, it's an acknowledgement that the political transition is the most difficult aspect of the Syrian conflict. It's also an acknowledgement on the part of John Kerry. He's becoming closer and closer to the uh, position of his Russian counterpart. It's also an acknowledgement on the part of the Americans that Assad will be with us for a long time. Um, it's also the fact is that the Americans now are prioritizing humanitarian questions, mm -hmm. uh, a ceasefire, uh, that the political uh, horizon or dynamics are very complex. Uh, all in all, I think it's a plus, uh, a major basically plus for Russia, and it's a big minus uh, for the Americans, even though, as you know, uh, there is a major debate taking place within the US government uh, this, the Defense Department and the intelligence community um, have deep suspicions about what Kerry is trying to do. Mm -hmm. They have no trust in the Russian leadership. So, first of all, we do not know if Kerry and Lavrov uh, uh, will succeed in basically reaching a deal. And secondly, what we do not know, whether the Americans and the Russians can really exert pressure on their counterparts in order to deliver. Give you a question quickly. Will Russia be able to convince Syria and Iran to ground its bombers? Mm. Uh, Russian, the, Russian air, the Syrian Air Force is the strategic, is the force multiplier for the Syrian government. And part of the agreement between Russia and America is that uh, to ground the Air Force. And on, on the other side, will the United States convince its regional powers 
to convince the Syrian opposition and rebels to basically separate from al-Nusra. Al-Nusra is the official arm of al-Qaeda. Mm. So all in all, the priority, as you've said, is now for the ceasefire, for humanitarian questions, for the fight against terrorism. And secondly, there is no assurance that the Americans and the Russians can really convince mm. their um, uh, regional allies to uh, basically abide by the uh, Russian-American uh, agreement. Danasi Kambani, let's bring you in. You seem to be nodding there at times. Do you agree with what Fawaz is saying? Uh, in, in general terms, but there's, there's, two, there's two really big underlying uh, questions or problems here. The first mm. is, will the US make up its mind about whether it wants to shape the situation in Syria or respond to it? And I think we're, what we're seeing right now is, this, is the symptom of a US, a continuing US desire not to get more involved. Uh, but the second and more important one is that this whole conversation is premised on a bunch of fictions that have almost no uh, bearing on the, the reality of the dynamics in, in rebel side Syria. So, the question of disengaging from Nusra, uh, we've seen time and time again FSA branded, Free Syrian Army branded units that work with the US and the Saudis and other friends of Syria, so called, uh, are unable, even when they want to, to defy Nusra or to separate from them. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's a battlefield reality where Nusra uh, is dominant and and whenever it is challenged by one of these groups it mm -hmm. crushes those groups and runs them out of northern syria so the u.s in in talks with russia going back to last fall has been touting the the existence of this uh again so-called moderate opposition that it is hesitant to define uh or give the location of and in fact it cannot meaningfully ask these groups to dissociate from nusra geographically or operationally, because if it does, those groups will cease to exist. Mm. And I think whatever agreement Lavrov and Kerry are trying to reach is going to founder on those technical details that are much more than just technicalities. Okay, Shabanda, let me bring you in, and I want your comments, if you wouldn't mind, on the actual strategy. If we put aside almost what Fawaz and Thanasi have just been saying about all the problems, let's say we actually get this strategy in place. The, the, the theory of coordinated airstrikes, there is some sense to it, is there not? Well, I mean, let's, let's start from the very beginning. What is the strategy here? And it's important to remember that the Geneva communique, which was the framework for the peace negotiations um, in Geneva, included um, many sections on the need to fight terrorism and to reach a political transition that would, uh, you know, that would establish stability, ceasefires that would be a critical, uh, fundamental starting point to fight terrorism and to fight ISIS and other extremist groups. Unfortunately, the Geneva peace discussions seem to be have been uh, stillborn. And mm. as a result, that's why we are seeing Kerry essentially capitulating to Russian demands in Moscow, where, whereas the Russians, the Russian strategy is to not just prioritize fighting terrorism necessarily per se, but to prioritize um, any to uh, moving moving aside any discussion that would lead to a uh, systemic political transition mm. away from the regime and the rule <clears throat> of Bashar al-Assad. So in that sense, the Russians really seem to have an upper hand. Now, when it comes to fighting terrorism, it's a qu we have to then look at the strategy of what comes first, the chicken or the egg here. Yes. Do you establish a no-fly zone? Do you establish a, uh, um, a, you know, a, do you prioritize ending civilian uh, airstrikes that are targeting civilians as a means to stop the chaos and then to work with Sunni rebel groups and Kurdish rebel groups mm. um, and others uh, who are fighting ISIS? Or do you continue to allow the regime air force, which just over the weekend alone struck five hospitals in Aleppo? So how is that fighting terrorism? Mm. And, uh, and as a reminder, of course, uh, the, the Russians have a very strong hand in the regime's strategy, military strategy on the ground and in their uh, continued airstrikes. So it certainly seems that the Russians have no will, if not desire, to tell Bashar al-Assad to halt these airstrikes against the civilian populace and against hospitals. And so then one must wonder to... what leverage does, do the, can the Americans bring forth to the table in telling the rebels uh, to, to cease their fire or to disassociate 
from al-Nusra if they cannot get the Russians yeah. to tell the regime to stop their strikes against civilians. And this would speak to obey what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Joseph Dunford, said when he said, quote, we're not entering into a transaction that is founded on trust. I mean, that's a concern if you've got two diplomats working away at this plan and your Joint Chief of Staff says, oh, actually, not too keen on this. Well, that's, that, you know, that comment is a reflection of we're incoherence all, in Washington when it comes to its Syria policy, mainly because there is no Syria policy. Many analysts in Washington will tell you that the Kerry visit to Moscow is simply a Hail Mary. Um, and it certainly, had, you know, the, the optics are very bad. You know, right within 24 hours of Kerry meeting Lavrov, you know, we saw escalated regime airstrikes against civilian populace in northwestern Syria and northeastern Syria. Uh, so it certainly doesn't seem to be, you know, what the, the American approach to resolving the crisis in Syria does not seem to have, you know, m many, many backers on the ground within mm. the Syrian opposition. Fawaz Georges, let me come back to you. From everything I've heard, all three of you gentlemen say, I can't hear anything that will really benefit the Syrian people in the short or the long term. Now, I've read articles with people saying, well, this might be the, the stepping off point for something which can help bring down the death toll. Am I missing something here? Because I can't see anything, Fawaz, that's bringing down the death toll. Uh, Kamal, let me play the devil advocate for a second here. Uh, uh, if you ask me, if, I, if you can summarize the American position, I don't say a strategy, the American position. The American position as basically uh, advanced by Kerry and the State Department is to de-escalation, de-escalation, de-escalation. They want to basically have a ceasefire. They want the Syrian government and its allies to accept the ceasefire. And their understanding is that only Russia can help exert pressure on the Syrian regime to ground its air force. At the heart of the so-called agreement, Russian-American agreement, is grounding the Syrian air force. Mm. That is, if the agreement succeeds in the next 10 days, remember, they're still talking. And Kerry mm. said they need about 10 days. The idea behind the American initiative is that they want to ground Syrian bombers. Syrian bombers will not be, would not be able to fly over areas where the moderate opposition exists in Syria or even where al Nusra exists. This is a major, major concession on the part of the Russians if the Russian can convince the Syrian government and of course Iran to ground its air force. Because so the, it's not just prioritizing hmm. the fight against terrorism, against al Nusra and against ISIS, is to basically begin the process of military de-escalation and the fight against al-Nusra and ISIS, and then begin the process, basically the political transition. So Kerry's strategy is he wants also to bring humanitarian assistance to all areas besieged in Syria. So the ceasefire, grounding the Syrian air force, which make a qual it would make a qualitative shift, uh, because we know how, how I mean, the, 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 the Syrian air force, the damage that it does. Mm. So again, because if you ask, why the Americans are really focusing on this particular angle, on military de-escalation. Because first of all, they do not really want to invest strategically in Syria. Syria is not a high priority on the agenda of Barack Obama. Barack Obama has just a few months mm -hmm. uh, in office and the idea is let's de-escalate, let's really decrease the number of casualties, let's fight terrorism and then we can see whether political transition is possible. Because at the end of the day, there is a huge divide between the Americans and mm. the Russians about the political transition. Okay, the then, Russians want, a, nat Sorry, want gonna... a national unity government. The Americans want basically a genuine political transition. Okay, let me, let me jump in because I want to get comments from our other two guests. Then I'll see if I come to you first. Um, the more Fawaz explained that situation there, and I made some notes here about helping, uh, Russia helping exert pressure and grounding Syrian bombers, uh, frankly, the more ridiculous it starts to sound. I mean, you can't imagine Assad grounding his own bombers f for anyone, really. Well, look, we're, we're, we're fast running out of, of the existence of an alternative Syrian military opposition. So six months ago, or even three months ago, there was a credible non-jihadi Syrian armed opposition. 
Uh, and that, uh, that is precisely the demographic of opposition that has been most heavily targeted by the Russians since last fall when they entered the conflict directly. So by the time these negotiations are winding down, there will be almost nothing to speak of other than Ahrar al-Sham, Nusra, and ISIS as the armed opposition in Syria. And if and when that comes to pass, almost all hope for a real negotiated tra uh, political transition uh, will go out the window. Uh, and that's a really important bedrock reality because what the Russians have done is they've accelerated that Syrian government strategy of wiping out the middle, wiping out the politically reconcilable uh, uh, oppositionists who are willing to negotiate so that all that is left uh, is jihadists. The other thing to keep in mind here is that uh, John Kerry is not calling the shots or setting American policy. The White mm. House is. And sadly, uh, I, I disagree in framing with our guests. I believe there is a U.S. Uh, strategy, which I believe is misconceived and incorrect. That strategy is predicated on a misunderstanding. It's predicated on a belief that Syria's meltdown is containable, uh, it's a local regional problem, and it doesn't really matter in the wider world. I think events have shown that is, that's crazy, that's wrong. Uh, it matters to Europe, it matters to the region, it matters to all the neighboring countries, and it's had all kinds of blowback from the immigration crisis uh, to, I think, unprecedented strain on the Arab state system. And that is the, the wider context here. The, the Kerry Lavrov agreement, if it comes to pass, is just going to delay uh, a reckoning in which the US is going to be one of many countries that's going to have to deal with a major, and I think, sadly, catastrophic fallout from the meltdown of, of the Syrian state. Mm. Ubay in, in Riyadh, Tanasi is right there, isn't he? The fact that it's, it's almost trying to contain a problem that it, it spread out beyond Syria a long time ago, didn't it? This has been the Obama administration's plan from the very beginning, which was supposedly to contain the fallout of the, of, of the fight in Syria, which began, as we all know, as a civil demonstrations and an uprising against the regime and then led to a civil war. And I think we have to be very clear here that the lack of will by the Obama administration to deal directly with the crisis in Syria has led to Syria becoming a safe haven for terrorists such as ISIS and even uh, groups like al-Qaeda and Nusra, which have international attack planning cells in northern Syria and certainly have designs to attack Western interests globally. And I think this lack of will and lack of desire to hold the Russians accountable, to hold the regime's air force accountable, this lack of will has, prior, has incentivized the Assad regime to continue these atrocities and crimes against humanity. Within 24 hours of the Lavrov Kerry meeting, hmm. the city of Aleppo was fully encircled by Assad regime forces and Iranian militias. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of civilians trapped and potentially facing a siege unprecedented in modern history. And yet we don't see any commitment by the United States to hold the regime accountable for mm. its crimes and to prevent yet another mass scale atrocity in Aleppo as we've seen elsewhere in Syria committed by the Assad regime's forces mm. and its forces fully backed by the Russian military. And I think that sends a very loud message to Moscow and to the Assad regime that if the Americans are not willing, that specifically the Obama administration, is not willing to hold uh, the regime's forces accountable or the Russian air force accountable, then they have very little incentive to abide mm. by any ceasefire or de-escalation. You know, though, to be uh, I to think be it will fair. be left up to a future American administration on whether or not to give uh, Syrian rebels the tools that they need, such as man pads, mm. to take down uh, the, the regime's air force. Otherwise, without a shift of the military calculus on the ground, I simply don't see any way to de-escalate from the current situation. To be fair to the US and Russia, and this is me playing devil's advocate this time, they have not been able to do anything, for sure. The UN uh, special envoys, we've gone through, I don't know how many of them now, they have not achieved anything. The Arab League had a summit in Nuakchot the other day, only seven of the leaders actually turned up. There is inaction everywhere on this, is there not? Uh, Fawaz, let me start with you. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, no one can disagree that Syria has not been prioritized by the Obama administration. Uh, quite a few uh, red lines have been basically forgotten by the Obama administration. The question we're talking about today, how do we move forward? And keep in mind, uh, Russian military intervention in Syria 
has really changed the landscape in Syria uh, in terms of allowing the Syrian regime to gain the upper hand. We're talking about Aleppo. Aleppo is a strategic battlefield, as you know. Uh, now the Syrian army and its allies have the upper hand. And even if you have a third round of talks in Geneva, uh, again, uh, Russia and the Syrian regime have the upper hand. But finally, to, add, to, to address your question, this is a very complex conflict. Of course. Uh, we're talking about the Syrian conflict. If somehow this is an internal Syrian conflict, you have multiple regional war by proxies. You have American, Russian, uh, basically, rivalry in Syria. And the reality is Russia is much more committed in Syria than the Americans are. Mm. The reason why Russia has the upper hand, because Russia is willing to invest strategic assets in Syria. The Americans are not. We can criticize the Obama administration as much as we do. The reality on the ground now, how do we de-escalate? How do we minimize the humanitarian tragedy, the greatest since World War II? How do we save Syrian lives? How do we, can Syria be rescued? Um, and I, I fully agree that uh, uh, I don't think this particular agreement, the outlines of the agreements, will put an end to the bloodbath that's, take, that's taking place in Syria. The second administration, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, will most likely inherit uh, the deadly situation in Syria and the neighboring countries as well. Sanasi, give me some good news here. Give me something that we can take from this, because there's got to be, you know, I mean, uh, I mentioned the UN Special Envoy, Stefan de Mistura. He's talking in Geneva with representatives. I mean, is there anything here? I think there's no good news, and I think yeah. the, the honest, I mean, for months now, my struggle has been to try and get people to talk in, in Washington and around Washington with some honesty about what options they're willing to consider and what the real costs and prices are. And the way I see it is there's really only three likely outcomes in Syria. One is the status quo, which, as we've seen, displaces millions and kills hundreds of thousands and causes tremendous instability. Or there's the path where the international community decides to let the regime win. Uh, with uh, Russia and Iran accelerating their uh, campaign on Aleppo and elsewhere and just let them have it. And the third option, which is the interventionist or escalation option, is for the U.S. and its partners to use these strategic assets that Fawaz was referring to and get more involved and invest in the conflict, knowing that that will be messy, that mm -hmm. there aren't any neat uh, and, and uh, uh, clearly effective proxies. And they would do it in the, in the hopes uh, that it will increase the likelihood of a real political negotiation. And that is, that's, that's not a sure shot, right? That's a, that's a gamble. That's saying right now there's a 0% chance of a negotiated political settlement that isn't just a victory for Assad. Mm. And if the West invests real firepower, uh, the man pads uh, that Ubay was referring to or yep. other really meaningful forms of pressure, that won't make it a 100% chance of a political settlement. That might raise it to 30 or 40. That's, now that's, by the way, an option I think is wise. I think that would actually be worth it. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's hard to tell a politician uh, to, to take on those kinds of odds. Ubay Shabanda, 60 seconds left. Do you like any of those options that Fanisi just, uh, just outlaid there? Well, I certainly like the, that last option of giving uh, man pads, you know, surface to air missiles to rebel forces to shift the military balance um, on the ground. Look, the Obama administration is, the, is in the twilight of its, of, of its, uh, of its rule, of, of its current administration. And if it didn't have the willpower a year ago, two years ago, or, or three years ago, when the red lines were first laid out, I really don't see it uh, taking any direct action to hold the regime and the Russians accountable. I think you need a political solution to deal with the terrorism crisis in Syria. You need a political solution to deal with the humanitarian crisis in Syria. And you need both sides to come to the table. But until the United States of America fully commits to backing its allies to the same level that the Russians back theirs, then I simply don't see any real aspect for a lasting, sustainable, and just solution in Syria. Gentlemen, it's been great to get all of your thoughts today. That was uh, Ubay Shabandar joining us from Riyadh along with Fawaz Jerjes, who is in London, and Thanasi Kambani in Beirut. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Do appreciate it. And to you at home, thank you again for watching Inside Story. You can see this program again or any of our previous shows by visiting the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head to our Facebook page. That is facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. We're on Twitter as well. We are at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Kamal AJE if you want to send a message to me. From me and the whole team, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon.